Good afternoon, members, friends, and supporters of Maritime History Society. I am Sabha Purkar, Project Research Associate at MHS, and I welcome you back to the second session of the annual Maritime History Conclave. The theme of today's second session is Historical Narratives of Maritime Security of India. India's quintessential maritime character and vital geostrategic location are twin factors that have defined our growth as a nation and evolution as a cosmopolitan civilization. As the resident maritime power in Indian Ocean, the Indian Navy is increasingly seen as a dependable partner in maintaining the existing regional equilibrium. History is witness to the fact that whenever India has neglected this vast body of water, it has lost its sovereignty, as was seen during the span of colonization by the European powers. The session focuses on examining the maritime dimensions of Indian security through various historical narratives in a comprehensive manner. To start the session one, I would like to introduce Professor Sanjay Jha. He is a Professor Dean of School of National Security Studies at the Central University of Gujarat. He joined the Central University of Gujarat in 2012 and served as a chairperson for the Center for Security Studies, Dean of the School of International Studies, Dean of Student Welfare, Registrar and Provost. Professor Jha has more than 20 years of experience as a researcher, analyst, teacher, research supervisor, project director and administrator at re research institutes, think tanks and the government of India. Now I invite Professor Jha to deliver the special remarks. Honorable Vice Admiral R. Hari Kumar, Flag Officer Commander, Commanding in Chief Western Naval Command, Professor Rama Sunkar Dubey, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Central University of Gujarat, Mr. Hasmukh Shah, Chairman and Founder of Darsak Itihas Nidhi, Vice Admiral A. R. Karve, Patron MHS, Rear Admiral Atul Anand, Vice Chairman MHS, Commodore Robi Thomas, Director MHS, Distinguished lead speakers, moderators, participants, and all maritime enthusiasts. On behalf of the School of National Security Studies and Maritime History Society, I extend a very warm welcome to all of you to the second session of annual Maritime Conclave uh, 2021. We are gathered here to acknowledge India's rich and thriving history of nautical knowledge and maritime security and recognize the importance of early medieval history as a means to promote maritime consciousness. I would like to thank Maritime History Society to collaborate with us on academic front. Establishment established in 2018, the School of National Security Studies has three centers. Center for Security Studies, Center for Studies in Strategic Technologies, where focus is on cyber and space security, and Center for Maritime Security Studies. The key third area of maritime security and studies, maritime history, uh, blue economy, coastal planning and management, piracy, irregular warfare at sea, maritime trade, maritime law and governance, security and governance in Indian Ocean. CUG has also signed an MOU with Naval War College Goa and intends to explore other such possibilities of academic and research collaboration with the institutions engaged in the field of maritime studies. We will soon be launching a certificate course in maritime security and organized training program from officials from various government organizations, researchers, and other stakeholders. The center is also planning to offer PhD program with an interdisciplinary focus relating to history, international relations, and strategic studies. Given the importance of Gujarat's historical connections with the larger world, center aims to focus on issues related to Gujarat's coastal and maritime security. As our Honorable Vice Chancellor Sir noted that Gujarat has a rich maritime history and traditions in fields like traditional shipbuilding and navigation techniques, heritage of the coastal communities and extensive trade and cultural links. 
seaboard trade has been carried out for centuries between India's western coast and Gulf, as well as the East African countries. Large wooden boats, also known as doge, carrying cotton textiles, rich and leather items, rice and leather items used to sail out from the ports of Kutch, Porbandar, uh, Veraval, Jam Jamnagar and Surat in Gujarat to ports in Dubai, Muscat, Somalia and Ethiopia. The state is rapidly growing as India's maritime hotspot and has tremendous potential to develop in areas of port management, maritime trade and commerce. The objective of today's annual maritime conclave is to review the significance of India's cultural and civilizational nautical linkage to the world and to probe the field of maritime history and international relations through the inputs of esteemed academicians and potential young scholars here. Honorable Vice Admiral R. Hari Kumar identified a very important aspect that is historically Indian tradition in nautical matters or tracing the early history of maritime security, we lacked a strong evidence. Today, both organizations are skillfully weaving a narrative based on a strong research approach and practice. I thank Dr. Ashoka Raj Sikhe and Dr. Dinesh Karmakar for their insights and understanding of various coastal features, cartographic forms, uses of navigational aids, vessel features, and shipbuilding, which form a crucial part of ancient Indian nautical knowledge. It is important to embark upon this very important question. That is, why is it important to understand early and medieval history of India's maritime security? For a maritime nation like India, it is conception of maritime security of the Indian Ocean region and specifically its approach to maritime security has roots in the maritime history. It is thus important to encourage a study of Indian maritime history and heritage to enhance contemporary regional and global maritime issues to evolve an inclusive strategy way forward. An early glimpse of India's maritime worldview can be gleaned from the studying as the role played by naval rulers like Cholas and Sri Vijayas who skillfully stamped a lasting impact on Indian history and influenced the events leading to the emergence of armed maritime power in India. K.M. Panikkar made the case for a strong maritime orientation for India. He asserted that India had a powerful naval tradition and had enjoyed the command of seas around it until the beginning of the 16th century. Kem Panikkar, in his seminal work, elucidated the conditions under which the Indian maritime security had to develop. This historical uh, legacy has strongly steered India's maritime thinking from a coastal preponderance to a blue water navy. Anchored in this Indian philosophy of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, Indian seafarers sailed and sustained in the core belief that seas were the common heritage of mankind. Commencing from coastal ventures in the prehistoric period, a number of maritime kingdoms and coastal communities crossed the Indian Ocean. The maritime venture never waned, and through the centuries, Indian naval empires of Cholas, Sri Vijayas, and more led native naval resistance with effectiveness. Indigenous Indian naval history is a rich saga and this led to their sporadic success in naval diplomacy and maritime governance in the Indian water. These ancient empires outstandingly helped medieval India build its maritime structure and maritime security strength. Session 2 of the annual Maritime Conclave 2021, Historical Narratives of Maritime Security of India will delve into examining early and medieval history dimensions of India's maritime security. Maritime governance and security as seen in the early Indian text, the, we have a strong evidence 
that uh, early maritime contribution of Chola and Sri Vijaya that contributed greatly to uh, the in, to the uh, evolution of uh, consciousness on maritime security from early times. They exercised supremacy over the Indian Ocean from very early times and strategically envisaged maritime governance through various uh, constituents. The second uh, issue relates to empires of sea, uh, maritime power in me medieval India. The maritime empires like uh, the Majapahit and the Sri Bijan exercised effective maritime power and we would understand how they had an overarching strategy for achieving maritime strategy goals since historical time. And uh, the, uh, related to this theme of maritime uh, consciousness, an important issue is maritime security construct concepts of parity, parity and maritime trafficking. In this section, we'll understand how piracy as a non-traditional threat was dealt with in the early and medieval times using the case studies of naval kingdoms of Cholas and Sri Bijayas who built coastal defense system to fight heightened piracy at the streets of Malacca and Sunda. Indian, Indian view of maritime security in ancient Indian, in Indian Ocean has been driven and affected by the influences and strategic thought process, processes conducted in the early and medieval history of India. We are grateful to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Ramasankar Dube, for gracing this academic conclave with his keynote address. And he rightly said that India's maritime routes are amongst the oldest in the world, traceable to the Harappan civilization more than three millennia ago. Jai Hind. Thank you, Professor Jha. Continuing with the session, we have a remarkable lineup ahead of us with the presentation of some scholarly papers. With the recent commissioning of India's powerful destroyer, Defense Minister Rajnath Singh said, and I quote, INS Vishakapatnam as a symbol of the country's security, growing maritime progress, and a major milestone of make in India, make for the world. As we are moving towards our ancestral legacy of indigenous shipbuilding, Relatively, it is important to understand our naval expeditions held in the maritime past to protect the maritime environment. This session is moderated by Professor Mansi Singh, who is Assistant Professor at Center for Security Studies and Coordinator, Center for Maritime Security Studies at School of National Security Studies, Central University of Gujarat. She has published in peer-reviewed journals of Sage and Brill and has contributed several book chapters to edited volumes of Ruthless and Paul Gray. Her research interests include European Union, foreign policy, global governance and multilateralism, security development linkage, regional security in South Asia and India's foreign policy. The lead speaker for this session, Professor Uttara Sahasrabude, is a professor of international relations at the Department of Civics and Politics, University of Mumbai. She is also a board member of the Editors of Asian Politics and Policy, published by Wiley Blackwell. She was invited by the European Commission to Brussels, Belgium in April 2010 as an evaluator for the seventh framework research program of the European Union. Currently, Dr. Uttara Sahasrabude is a member of Global India, a Horizon 2020 funded European training network and a member of the International Advisory Board Glo Global Governance and European Union. Meanwhile, there are three paper presenters for the session. Our first presenter is Mr. Vyankatesh Rangan, who is a financial executive by profession. He is also an author and historian by passion in the field of Indian history he has written research papers and authored the book, The First Republic, The Untold True Story of the Imperial Karbari Sarkar. Our second presenter is Ms. Francie Burgess, who is currently pursuing her final year of bachelor's degree, majoring in history with honors from St. Xavier's College. She is currently a marketing ambassador at Viral Fission and also an intern at Ed Era Consultancy. 
And last but not the least, Colonel Arun Agarwal, who has done a number of professional and civil courses. Apart from compulsory infantry courses, the officer has done his post-graduation from Defence Services Staff College, Wellington, and Senior Command course from Army War College. He is currently a Senior Fellow at Centre for Land Warfare Studies, New Delhi, and is working on artificial intelligence. May I now invite Professor Mansi Singh to take over this session. Thank you, Sabha. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me once again thank Maritime History Society for organizing this event and inviting Central University of Gujarat to be the collaborating partner for the sales conclave. So this marks our second such initiative after a two-day workshop on maritime journey of contemporary Indian security that we had jointly organized with MHS in February 2020. Such academic deliberations serve to contribute to the discourse on defining India's evolving maritime outlook. The Center for Maritime Security Studies at Central University of Gujarat aims to focus on issues related to Gujarat's coastal and maritime security and India's role in the Indian Ocean, particularly its engagement with the Arabian Sea littorals. As session one, sorry, Gujarat has a rich maritime history and traditions in fields like traditional shipbuilding and navigation techniques, heritage of the coastal communities, and extensive trade and cultural links. The state is rapidly growing as India's maritime hotspot and has tremendous potential to develop in areas of port development, maritime trade and commerce. The theme of this session is historical narratives of the maritime security of India. And I feel this theme becomes pertinent as the geographical expanse of India's maritime challenges has grown considerably, especially in the last few decades with the country's growing regional and international profile and expanding economic links. In the last session, we had discussions on Indian navigational skills, shipbuilding, and maritime links through trade and commerce. This created rich cross-border maritime connections and communities. While we have to majorly rely on accounts and records authored by Western historians, which rarely make mention of the seafaring skills of the ancient Arabs, the Chinese, or the Indians, but yet we do find that there is tangible evidence of India's widespread cultural, religious, and linguistic imprint, not just around the Indian Ocean Rim, but also extending from the Mediterranean to the Pacific. So in that context, it is important to examine how these civilizational linkages and cultural narratives have been strategically woven into contemporary maritime strategy. As an emerging economy, there has been a significant increase in India's sea trade, and therefore to secure its commercial interests, India needs to focus on maritime connectivity, safe sea communications, and develop its port infrastructure. India has also enhanced its global stature by emerging as a net provider of security in the Indian Ocean region and beyond. It has proven its credentials as a first responder for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. The Indo-Pacific has become a pivotal zone for global strategic competition. As countries compete for influence and leadership in the region, revisiting the historical narratives could also help in understanding India's strategic engagement in the region. The fact is that India is a maritime nation, not just by historical tradition, but also because of its geophysical configuration and geopolitical circumstances. Today, maritime security has become a critical pillar of Indian foreign policy engagements. India presiding over the UN Security Council's session on maritime security in August this year marks the country's growing international standing as a key player in the shared commons. India has taken the lead in outlining key issues concerning maritime security and calling for a collaborative strategy to combat multifaceted and multidimensional threats from natural disasters and non-state actors, conserving maritime environment and resources, and promoting responsible maritime connectivity. India, therefore, must continue to build on this maritime moment, leveraging opportunities and partnerships in addressing its concerns and challenges. And it is in this context that this session of this annual conclave becomes meaningful in steering conversations on various aspects of maritime security and drawing inferences and knowledge from our past. I now welcome and invite our lead speaker for this session, Professor Uttara Sahasrabuddhi, to share her insights on the theme. Over to you, Professor. Thank you, Dr. Manasi Singh. Honorable Vice Admiral R. Hari Kumar, Flag Officer Commanding in Chief of Western Naval Command, 
प्रोफेसर रमाशंकर दुबे वाइस चांसलर सेंट्रल यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ गुजरात मिस्टर हर्षमुख शाह फाउंडर एंड चेयरमैन ऑफ दर्शक इतिहास निधि वाइस एडमिरल ए आर करवे द पैटर्न ऑफ द मैरिटाइम हिस्ट्री सोसाइटी रियर एडमिरल अतुल आनंद वाइस चेयरमैन एम एच एस कमोडोर रॉबी थॉमस डायरेक्टर एम एच एस डिस्टिंग लीड स्पीकर्स मॉडरेटर्स पार्टिसिपेंट्स एंड ऑल मैरिटाइम इंथुजियास अ वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून टू यू ऑल एट द आउटसेट आई वुड लाइक टू कंग्रेचुलेट द मैरिटाइम हिस्ट्री सोसाइटी and the center for study security studies of the central university of gujarat for their collaborative effort in convening this annual maritime enclave and thank them for the opportunity given to me to be the lead speaker for this particular session the second session it's a pleasure and an honor for me most of us are aware that india has participated in cooperative maritime security missions since the early 21st century both in the eastern and western indian ocean these missions were launched primarily to meet the challenge of increasing piracy as well as that of trafficking thus the indian naval ships collaborated with the us navy for patrol missions around the strait of malacca for a few years since 2002 the indian navy has also been an active and significant contributor to the multi nation missions undertaken in gulf of aden since 2008 no ship under escort by the indian navy in the region has ever been hijacked navy's efforts in the gulf of aden and its efforts in collaboration with the indian coast guard in the arabian sea have resulted in effectively shifting the piracy high risk area closer to the somali coast from central arabian sea the idea of indo pacific may be succinctly described as eastward expansion of the indian ocean region both regions are significant from the point of view of india for over a decade now india is an active member of the quadrilateral security dialogue known as the quad and one of the objectives of the quad is to secure freedom of navigation in the indo pacific region the origin of the ideas of freedom of navigation freedom of the seas good order at sea etc is traced back to european and western world in the 17th century rightly so to an extent as mare liberum was elaborated by hugo grotius the dutch jurist and philosopher in his book published in the year 1609 however the fact that these ideas were practiced in the eastern hemisphere since before the medieval period is relatively less known and that the philosophy behind the indian navy's anti piracy missions of the 21st century is consistent with its role in the indian ocean region during the early and medieval history is even less appreciated the maritime vision and prowess that india had until the medieval period was destroyed during the colonial period and was never seriously revisited and revived after independence until after the 1971 war india's modern concept of and its approach to maritime security of the indian ocean region has a long historical legacy that needs to be explored and analyzed the sub themes of this session aim to do precisely this explore the ways in which indians perceived maritime security and maritime governance during ancient and medieval times the indian subcontinent can be geographically divided into northern india and peninsular india just as the notions of security and insecurity of northern india were historically shaped by the bounds of the hindu kush and the himalayas the notions of security and insecurity of peninsular india were historically shaped by the waters of the arabian sea the bay of bengal the malacca strait and beyond india has a multimillennial legacy of 
traversing through the littoral and the hinterlands of the Indian Ocean, thanks to the ancient and medieval Indian kingdoms and empires. This has resulted in establishing a connect across what is called in the modern times the Indian Ocean region. Trade and commerce were the vehicles of this connect, while exchange of cultures, languages, and cuisines were its impact. On the day of Kartik Purnima each year, people in Odisha celebrate a festival known as Bali Yatra. This is a tribute to their ancestors during the days of Kalinga Empire, who used to begin their sea voyage eastward every year on Kartik Purnima, taking advantage of the returning monsoon winds. Just as the Kalinga dynasty, further south in the early and late Chola dynasties, engaged in voyages and trade missions eastward, going beyond even the Strait of Malacca. These Indian kingdoms had established relations with the Sri dynasty, ruling the peninsula in southern Sumatra at that time. While these trade and voyages are believed to be largely free of conflict, they were occasions of conflict and war, and the maritime capabilities of the Indian kingdoms and empires were proved even during these occasions. Naval capabilities of the Indian kingdoms were also used to mitigate threats of piracy, both in the early and the late medieval period. The earliest records of India's maritime history are found in the Vedic literature. However, the first instances of naval wars are during the Chola reign. Raja Raja Chola and Rajendra Chola had carried out expeditions that resulted in the conquer of parts of what is modern day Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Thailand, Malaysia, and Indonesia. They had established dominance over the Eastern Indian Ocean. The early maritime contribution of the Cholas reveals that they might have strategically envisaged maritime governance through various constituents. For example, Raja Raja's defeat of the Chera Navy at Kandalur was possibly to break their monopoly in trade and handling maritime security issues. The growing menace of piracy in the waters of Malacca Strait during the medieval period was fueled by littoral support. The Chola expeditions in this part of the world were also partly interventions to curb acts of piracy. Apart from maintaining a powerful navy, Cholas also maintained an intelligence corps to monitor foreign vessels, and groups of reformed pirates were deputed informally to keep a watch on rogue elements in the seas. They also had a coastal defense system complete with a coast guard. This underlines how the Indian kingdoms viewed maritime power, maritime security, and good governance in the maritime domain since historical times. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Seas gives significant new rights to the states vis-a-vis -vis the maritime domain. It also simultaneously establishes the duties of the states towards the safety of the activities at sea, campaigns against crimes at sea, as well as the protection of the maritime environment. Many contemporary states lack the capacity to execute their rights, perform their duties, and contribute to the protection of the global commons. India's maritime role thus becomes significant, not only due to its ability to exercise its own rights and perform its own duties, but also due to its ability to help other states do so. In this background, a look back at history to explore India's historical role in maritime security is important in understanding India's role in the present as well as in the future. This session focuses on examining the maritime dimensions of India's security through various historical narratives in a comprehensive manner. Alongside, it also attempts to study the political and social dimensions of such maritime empires and discuss how they effectively protected the maritime environment in the medieval era. Looking forward to the proceedings. Thank you and over.
to the moderator, Dr. Manasi. Thank you, Professor Sahastra Gurde, for uh, sharing a very rich insight on India's uh, rich maritime traditions. We have very uh, interesting papers lined up for this session. I would now invite uh, our first uh, panelist, our speaker, Mr. Venkatesh Rangan, who is presenting on Pratihara military operations in Iraq and Persian Gulf. Over to you, Mr. Venkatesh. Sure. Thank you, uh, Professor Mansi, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Ikshwa kukula unnatam, sucharitra, svanama ankitam, pratihara vansha deepaka, apara samudradhipati, samrajya dhipati, naga bhatta vatsa raja ankitam. This Sanskrit verse describes a mighty and powerful Indian emperor called Nagabhat II. 1200 years ago, this was this very same Nagabhat who launched spectacular naval strikes in multiple strategic ports in the Persian Gulf. This paper is a strategic and tactical study of this military operation. Next slide, please. Now, we have multiple sources across four different countries, Iraq, Iran, Oman, and India, which talk about a significant confrontation between the Indians and Arabs in the first two decades of the early 9th century. The first-hand accounts of Munir bin Rayan Ibadi and Tufail al-Ayan help us to narrow down the dates of this operation to 816 to 820 CE. Unfortunately, the details of these military operations are not so well studied in modern academicia and are generally clubbed together with general raiding patterns in the Western Indian Ocean. This paper seeks to reverse that trend by shedding some light on this operation. Next slide, please. Now, to start off with, who are the combatants? On the left-hand side, the powerful Pratihara dynasty, which dominated North Indian politics uh, in the 8th, 9th, and 10th century, uh, fading off in the 11th century. Uh, their principal imperial center from the 9th century was Kanyakubj, or Kannauj in modern-day Uttar Pradesh. On the right-hand side, uh, the Abbasid Caliphate, one of the mightiest empires in Middle Eastern history, which stretched from North Africa right down to the reaches of Xinjiang in China. Next slide. Now, why did this confrontation occur? Now, as a background of the general trend of militarization of the Western Indian Ocean starting from the 7th to the 9th century CE, we have multiple records of Arab naval raids against Indian commercial ports on the Western coast. Thana, Debal, Brabu Kachaka, Wallabi. Also, the Arabs invaded and conquered the kingdom of Sindh in 712 CE, largely through a sea-based invasion. So the sea-based route, which was used for this conquest. During the reign of the Abbasid Caliphate, that is during the reigns of Caliph Harun al-Rashid and Caliph al-Mamun, the aggressive raiding of the Arabs actually significantly scaled up and at least two significant raids were launched on the Saurashtra coast. Next slide. It was in such a condition of political turmoil that our unsung hero Nagabhat ascended the throne. Now, fortunately for us, we have a Sanskrit biography of Nagabhat, that is verse 6 to verse 12 of a 9th century inscription called the Gwalior Prashasti. As per this Prashasti, Nagabhat was fired by the dream of being a Chakravarti, of being a pan-Indian emperor. He also had a deep association with the oceans. His first political act was to unify the Kathiawad Peninsula. After nearly a century, the entire 1,000 kilometers coastline of Saurashtra was unified under one imperial umbrella. And the three principal kingdoms of the Gujarat Saurashtra region, Sindhav, Chalukya, and Chapa, became subordinate allies to the Pratihara standard. Now, Nagabhat tried to combine the maritime traditions of Gujarat with the martial traditions of Rashputana. So, on one hand, the superior navigational skills and hardy mariner traditions of the Tathawadi communities of the Sindhavas along with the infantry combat tactics and skills of the Guhila and Chahamana Rajputs. The dictum was clear, be a good sailor, but be a good soldier too. It was this ethos of the warrior sailor that laid the foundation of the Pratihara Navy. Nagabad's dream was rudely threatened by a massive Arab invasion launched under the Arab governor Sindh Bashar in between 813 and 815 CE. Though Nagabad defeated this invasion, he realized that being defensive was no longer an option. Next slide, please. As his Sanskrit biography tells us, Ananya Samadhana Vihina 
प्रताप क्रांत दिनमुख दैट इज डिप्लोमैटिक ऑप्शन नेक्स्ट लाइट प्लीज डिप्लोमैटिक ऑप्शन सच एज साम धन भेड़ डिप्लोमैट वेन नो लॉन्गर रेलिवेंट The temperament of Nagabhat felt that now was the time for Ananya Pratap to show an unparalleled show of military force to the adversary, the enemy in his own land, so that this deters any further invasion and incursion onto the Indian coast or to the Indian uh, land frontiers. Now this was easier said than done. If Nagabhat would attack the Arab positions in Sind, he would not be able to disrupt the sea lanes of communication. now one of the critical strengths of the arab garrisons of sind was there was a sea lane of communication going back all across the persian gulf to critical uh, commercial and military ports as per the 9th century arab geographer ibn khurtabi there were two principal sea lanes of communication between the arab empire and the uh, subcontinental position of sind marked in the red triangles the first sea lane of communication starting from basra in iraq to siraf modern day bandar siraf in iran to kais modern day kish island iran old hormuz tees ending in dibal in the vicinity of karachi this was the primary sea lane of military commercial and logistical support to the arab garrisons at sind if nagabhatta wanted to have his land offensive in sind to be successful he had to break and disrupt the sea lane of communication second sea lane of communication starting from basra siraf to zulfar rasal khaima in modern day uae dibba in modern day oman suhar muscat right down to the western coast ending in kullam mali modern day kollam in kerala this was secondary route but nagabhat had to also keep an eye on this route because counter strikes of arabs could be launched from staging grounds out here as verse 12 of his sanskrit biography tells us in a very lyrical fashion the dilemma of nagabhat was similar to that of sri ramchandra just like lord ram had to think how to cross the ocean and go to lanka and defeat ravan and he took the help of god varun for that here nagabhat had to think how to cross the upper samudra the western ocean and hit and subdue his lanka the lanka of his enemies next slide please a uh, part of the answer lay in a type of ship vessel what the arabs called the the barija of al hind the barijas were were wooden sail ships used for coastal hit and run tactics basically guerrilla warfare you you take out a strategic ta- target in a port hit a very critical marine infrastructure extricate yourself before the enemy can recover and respond each barija had a complement of 45 to 50 crew three light artillery nafatuns either flame or fire throwers or traction trebuchet a kind of light uh, lightweight catapult next slide please the operational plan of nagabhat was basically there will be 15 to 20 of such barijas 1000 marines or on 45 to 50 artillery pieces they would cross the strait of hormuz the very key maritime choke point hit at very key nodes of the sea lanes of communication three provinces selected al iraq al fars and musandam parallelly you have the black arrows on your right there would be a land offensive launched by the pratiharas in sind which was obviously the primary objective of nagabhat next slide please the first tactical achievement of this operation was crossing the straits of hormuz in complete invisibility it's very interesting you have we have two independent arabic sources which tell us that till the indians passed up to 600 nautical miles to the west of musandam that is in the head of persian gulf the omani authorities the ibadi imamate which controlled the straits of hormuz was completely clueless they in fact came to know that the indians had infiltrated after a group of missionaries informed them that hey we have been attacked so the complete stealth and surprise uh, uh, was i think the first tactical achievement second tactical achievement was the attack on al iraq now al iraq is the main province maritime province of the arab empire the arab abbasid caliphate empire this is like stri- striking shanghai of modern china or new york of united states or karachi of modern pakistan if you are striking al iraq you are virtually striking the den of the lion now uh, there are many very interesting details of the tactical uh, uh, nature of the operation i'll for want of time i'll just summarize now uh, the operational targets was in the red circle area in the right bank of the sit al arab which was a waterway connecting the persian gulf to the bas uh, to the uh, basra port it was much south to the military garrison now there's a big history behind this reorganization i won't get into that but the raid was extremely successful uh, ma- maritime and port infrastructure including government uh, buildings intra gulf ships which were anchored market and also huge storehouses and goods were set on fire or damaged 
also interestingly this when the raids were contested as per munir bin riyan when the raids were contested uh, the arabs suffered a bloody nose so nearly 50 arab combatants were killed and an uncounted number wounded so complete tactical dominance was established in skirmishes by the uh, indian maritime platoons which carried out the raids next slide please now the attack on basra completely psychologically deranged the entire arab military command the entire group of ibadi missionaries who went south of basra and actually witnessed the raids wrote a letter to imam ghasan of oman telling him that we have lost all faith in abbasid caliphate how could these people from surat and bardha so far away travel so far and attack us in nahar al ubula it is shocking where, where, where all the admirals sleeping of our uh, of our empire so stirred by this imam ghasan goes to suhar you can see on your left hand map the circle the first circle and he builds an offensive naval formation of shadas of ocean going boats of ocean ships rather to launch a counter strike on the indians however before he can do that the barija indian barija assaults preemptively attack his own homeland in the musandam peninsula the circle on your top where both zulfar on the western side of the peninsula and dibba on the eastern side of the peninsula are ferociously attacked now because of these attacks ghasan is forced to move his entire offensive shada fleet lock stock and barrel to the states of hormuz so what has really happened is the entire offensive nature of the arab posture has been neutralized the entire offensive fleet has now been reduced to a dummy coastal defense posture or coastal defense fleet imagine in modern times if i have an aircraft carrier and a destroyer but instead of putting them out in the sea i am so afraid of enemy attacks that i keep them close to my coast to protect my coast that's what precisely happened next slide please now the psychological and commercial disruptions as well as the military logical disruption raids strategically helped the pratihara land offensive uh, the gwalior prashasti tells us that nagabat uh, achieved singular success success in a sind campaign and large parts of eastern sind were annexed this is independently verified by the arab uh, arab traveler account of suleiman who says that the river sindhu passed through one of the towns of zurza or gurjara which is another name for the pratihara empire also the complete breakdown of the sea lanes of communication let uh, cause political turmoil within Mr. the arab Hunter, if you could just uh, wind up now sure, uh, sure. Yeah, just a uh, final yeah. slide yeah uh, so there was huge political turmoil there was a rebellion by the arab governors this eventually led to the end of the caliphate rule and uh, also uh, also uh, uh, the final independent uh, the establishment of independent principalities of mansura and multan Uh, also the naval raiding of the arabs we find no record of naval raiding arabs after this for the final slide can come to next slide please what is the key features of the pratihara maritime uh, doctrine very quickly uh, this was the approach of maritime denial and not maritime dominance so the pratihara navy didn't seek to dominate a sea lane of uh, communication or block a maritime choke point they hit at nodes connecting sea lanes of communication uh, this was a supportive posture to a primarily continental objective of attacking sind Uh, this also uh, differentiates the pratihara campaign from the later chola campaigns chola campaigns had a largely maritime objective to control the eastern trade and uh, mitigate the intermediation of sri vijayas pratihara campaigns were largely continental primarily but maritime uh, 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 tactics are very effective in breaking sea lanes of communication to conclude uh, with one final statement uh, the gwalior prashasti talks sky high about nagabhat we may or may not believe what the prashasti says but there is no doubt that nagabhat was a unique hero in the maritime history of india and despite not belonging to a coastal region or coastal state he recognized the importance of the maritime theater and the security of subcontinent and this is a message i think which will not be lost to us modern indians thank you thank you mr venkatesh that was indeed a very interesting take on this uh, ancient uh, military operation I now invite our next speaker, Ms. Frances Wer Francie Wergies, and she is presenting on ancient maritime trade, particularly focusing on the Indo-Roman trade. Over to you, Francie. One and all present here. I am Francie Wergies, a history student of Saint Xavier's College, Mumbai. I would like to thank a uh, maritime history society of india for giving me this golden opportunity of presenting a paper a research paper that i have written on ancient maritime trade with a prime focus on indo roman trade so without any delay let us move on to what i have written and let us discover it 
In the next slide, I have uh, mentioned about the timeline that is from 2nd century CE to 2nd century BCE. This is a time when India traded with Rome and uh, India not only traded with Rome but many other, other regions and other countries. Uh, let us look into that. So, in the next slides, trade relations. After that, in the next slide, we have Rome and Egypt, which, which were the major Western nations that India traded with. In the next slide, we have uh, Southeast Asian regions like China, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, etc. And finally, Ceylon, which is Sri Lanka. India also traded with Sri Lanka. They, in the next slide, we have certain titles used by various authors mentioned in their books, which I came across. And some of these were very fascinating to me. And uh, these are as follows. Pliny in his book, uh, in his natural history mentioned about India, referred to India as the mother of jewels. This could be because uh, Romans were very interested in jewels, particularly in Indian jewels and any jewel in certain. And so, uh, Pliny mentioned about India as the mother of jewels. Moving on, we have the book Peripolis of the Eritrean Sea. We do not know who the actual author is. Could be of uh, Greco-Roman origin. So this person mentions about India as the mistress of the Eastern Sea and further also as the queen of the Eastern Sea. This could be because India was the major trade center. Uh, India was between the Western world and the Southeastern nations and so any trade that uh, that was going on should have been a part of India and that is why India was called the mistress of the Eastern Ocean. Next slide we have certain sources. So there are two types of sources, literary sources and archaeological sources. Let us let me first discuss about the literary sources, the archaeological sources would be discussed further. So uh, there are three main books that one has to refer while uh, while studying about Indo-Roman trade. These books are more firstly and most importantly Peripolis of the Eritrean Sea. Next we have Pliny's Natural History and Ptolemy's Geography. So these are the three major books that one has to study while doing on this topic. And I couldn't go through all of these books. However, these books, however. I uh, referred to uh, Peripolis of the Eritrean Sea and a translated version of Pliny's Natural History. Ptolemy's Geography is available but it is in Latin and it is translated into various other languages but English. Pliny's Natural History was in French. I could refer to that because I know basic French. Apart from that, there were other... These books... Uh, Pliny's Natural History and Peripolis of the Earth and Sea are available online on archive.in. Other than that, some of the books I refer to are articles and books by various uh, professors, authors, uh, researchers and historians. And this, these, books, these books and articles were mainly concerned with ports in the southern part of India including Musiris, Patnam, Arika Medu, Kaveri, Patnam, etc. We uh, The next is the Sangam poems. There were stanzas of Sangam poems available even in the Peripolis of the Eritrean Sea which mentioned about, uh, which sh which mentioned about the Indo-Roman trade. Uh, uh, Kautilya's Arthashastra, there are certain stanzas from Kautilya's Arthashastra that I have mentioned in the, in my paper. Apart from that, a major help was a history of ancient and early medieval India from the Stone Age to the 12th century by Upendra Singh. Upendra Singh, she is a brilliant author and an Indian historian. She uh, she mentions in detail about everything, especially Indian history. And it has helped that this particular book has helped me a lot. Every ancient Indian culture student and history student refers to this book whenever it comes to studying, to having an overall knowledge, knowledge about what they are studying. Next, let us look into the trade routes and the major ports during this time so here is a map the blue points are the major ports some of the major ports are Arsino, Moyos, Hormos, Ber, Nike, Adeis and Aden in the western world and in India in our subcontinent we have Pabrikam, Barigaza, Sopara which is present in Ala Sopara um, Kalina which is Kalyan, Chawal which is somewhere in Alibag then in the southern part we have Mizuris Patnam, Kaveri Patnam, Arika Medu and the other ports in the next slide, we have a detailed version of what the trade route looked like. It starts from Mesopotamia. Actually, it's 
ends at Mesopotamia, but here let me speak about starting at Mesopotamia. And then it comes to the Red Sea, which is very narrow. I'll be discussing about the Red Sea later. Then there is the Indo-Roman trade route, which ends at uh, the southern part of India. Let us look into who introduced us to the Indo-Roman trade, the route. So Hippolys, he is a very famous a, a Roman captain and um, navigator who found out the Indo-Roman trade route. This intelligent person, with the help of the monsoon winds, planned his way through sea to India. So he started from Moyos Hormos in the month of July and he reached um, Adeus or Okeus within three weeks. And then from Okeus, he planned his route to India which took 40 days, 40 to 45 days in certain. And then they had to stay back in India for two months because uh, going, returning to Rome during that time wasn't favorable as the monsoon winds were in the opposite direction. They stayed back in India and returned with a bulk of goods, a huge amount of goods. And some of the um, sailors stayed back in India forever. Some stayed for one or two years and then sailed back. So looking at uh, the bulk goods, Mm. Uh, during the ancient times, the goods traded were in bulk. A huge amount, a huge quantity of certain products were traded. However, so uh, recently in the 1960s, there was this act which was passed, the Indian Customs Act of 1962, which says that now we can uh, trade customized goods, which is small quantity of books, goods like a silk sari or uh, a certain amount of pearls but uh, this was this is right now but back then we could only trade in bulks bulks now in the next slide we have camel trains so uh, when i was speaking about the red sea road which was very narrow the uh, the ships they uh, returned from india to rome and these goods were unloaded in Adeus or okayus and then from there they had to uh, they had to transport the goods the goods inland through camel trains to these camel trains because of the narrow route of the red sea and these camels took the goods up to alexandria which is the capital of rome this this is how the trade happened moving on to the commodities 10 percent luxury 10 percent animals and what would the 80 percent be it was spices of course and um, pepper was the ma most important the major the hero of the paper and let us now look into some of the major goods that was ex that was exported from india uh, the edibles include pepper turmeric spike nut ginger cardamom ghee sugar etc animals include uh, animal products include ivory horns skins and hides of animals rhinoceros tortoise tigers li leopards lions panthers etc luxury include cotton new zealand coal colored lac pearl silk etc and slaves sadly include women and eunuchs this was traded to and fro from india in the next slide we have sugar the word sugar itself originated from the sanskrit word sharkara sharkara today means jaggery in various south indian languages sugar was famous in um, rome till the 7th century after that they started growing their own sugar cane and they produced their own sugar However, pepper was the major spice. It was the hero spice. Pepper was used in cuisine. It was also used as uh, used in medicine, in medicine during those times. Moving on, we have incenses and perfumes, which was used with, by men as well as women. Uh, it was very aromatic, of course. It is today too, um, and it was also used to mask the uh, mask the smell of death during funeral rites, which is somewhat similar to the Indian the Indians. In the next slide, we have women wearing silk and a beautiful Roman woman wearing pearls, which were our Indian products. Next, we have the movie Gladiator. So there was this gladiatorial arena in Rome and this was a custom which was practiced. Men fought with tigers and we know that tigers existed in Rome, which was a product of India through certain mosaics which are present in the, in the slide. This is a para from a stanza from the Sangam literature which mentions three main products of that was uh, imported to India. The first one is wine, second one uh, is gold and the third one is slave gold and is slave girls. 
Some finds in India include Roman coins along with amphor, which was uh, found in certain ports in Kerala, like Muziris Patanam, Kaveri Patnam, and Arika Medu. This is the major. The next slide we have the statue of um, statue which is similar to the statue of Lakshmi. It was found in Via de la Bondanza uh, in the excavations of Pompeii. So this statue is similar to the statue of goddess Lakshmi. The jewelry, the um, garland, the entire the bindi in uh, on the forehead and is very similar to what we find in Indian temples in Maharashtra, especially in uh, temples in Tel district. So this is sudden archaeological findings and this is what is some uh, overall my paper about. And yes, this is all that I am to present. Thank you. Thank you, Francie. I now invite our uh, last speaker for this session, Colonel Arun Prakash Agarwal, who will be speaking on rise and fall of civilizations, a maritime perspective. Over to you, Colonel. Uh, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, mm -hmm. And thank you very much, uh, MHS and uh, Central University of Gujarat. Uh, for giving me this opportunity to present my paper, uh, a Rise and Fall of Civilizations, a Maritime Perspectives. Uh, uh, may I have this slide, please? Thank you. Yeah, next. So the very idea of this uh, topic, uh, you know, uh, came from this uh, recent quote by the Chief of Defense Staff, Jan Bipin Rawat, uh, regarding China's entry into uh, Turkey uh, and uh, Iran and thereafter uh, into Afghanistan. And uh, what he says uh, later is that, will that lead to a clash of civilizations? Uh, next slide, please. So when we talk about uh, civilizations, uh, they are not a political entity or a kingdom or a nation state, but you know they are a geographic settlement as we have seen uh, in the history, you know, uh, there'll be a set of natural resources, a perennial source of water, and they will have some sort of social uh, similarity, yet they have, they will have some sort of diversity in culture, heritage and traditions. But when it comes to economy and security, you know, it depends, you know, uh, what kind of uh, vision or the thought process of that, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, incumbents of that uh, civilization are whether you know they they are into the land warfare or they have also invested into uh, the civilization uh, into the maritime uh, domain. Uh, but what I uh, what my argument majorly will be that the maritime power uh, has got the ability uh, to protect uh, the civilization uh, as a whole. Next slide, please. So I have uh, put my talk into four parts. So largely I talk about two different kinds of uh, civilization. One is a mythological civilization and I'll present also present four oldest civilization, you know, what led to the fall, uh, the, the rise and thereafter the fall of these uh, civilizations. And then we'll analyze them, uh, the reasons and you know, where do we fit those lessons learned into the present India, uh, Indian maritime uh, perspective. Next slide, please. So coming on to the uh, rise and fall of the two oldest, you know, mythological civilizations. So here I will uh, be presenting these two civilizations. One is Sur. So Sur is, you know, uh, the, the, the inhabitants uh, which were living towards the east from where the sun rises, uh, Surya. So from Surya comes out the Sur and the, uh, the civilization which is uh, on the opposite side is the Asur, you know. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, an ancient painting. This painting is from Cambodia. Uh, now, uh, th uh, this uh, you will find uh, a similar painting in a lot of uh, texts in India. This is of Samudra Mantan, in which you will see a, a core in between. There is a mountain uh, which is called Mandar Parvat, uh, with a deity on the top. In India, that deity is Lord Ganesha, and then there is uh, this turtle called Kurma, uh, avatara of uh, Lord Vishnu. And then you go, you see a serpent, you know. Uh, horizontal and on either side, one side is uh, the Sur and the other side is uh, is Asur and 14 different valuable things, you know, including the moon came out of it. So now I'll just, you know, having read uh, various uh, texts, including Shiv Quran, Vishnu Quran and uh, also, you know, uh, internet uh, research uh, by some scholars, 
you know, I'll present this Samudra Mantan in the maritime perspective. Next slide, please. Yeah. So, uh, when we talk about the Mandar peak, you know, and uh, the deity which is on the top, uh, that is the Ganesha. So, what we can see is, you know, the, the earth without uh, without the water, you know, it's it's a huge core and it is it is rotating on its own axis, which automatically gives the churning, you know, uh, the, the, the form that it, you know, so something is getting churned. So on the on the uh, north, that is the Mandar Peak, is the North Pole or the Arctic, and the Kurma or the Turtle, you know, is the Antarctica or the you know, South Pole. And this entire Vasuki or the serpent, which is horizontally laid out, is the line of equator. So this entire battle, the uh, this entire maritime battle, would have taken place thousands of years ago along the line of equator because this was the place where the civilizations actually lived because that, that was a livable place at that time. And uh, this battle lasted for 1,000 years. And those 14 things which came out, which emerged from this, including the moon, uh, Dhanvantri, the lord of medicines, uh, lord of wealth. So basically, a large number of huge amount of research and development would have, would have taken place uh, in this particular uh, maritime battle. Uh, next slide, please. And such was the devastation of this battle that one piece of Pacific Ocean, you know, it came out and it went into the space, you know, what we uh, talk, talk as uh, called the moon. Uh, you know, uh, Charles Darwin's son has written in one of the papers uh, that, you know, if today we, uh, you take the structure of moon and you put it into the earth under the Pacific Ocean, you know, it will, uh, it will, uh, it will uh, properly fit over there. So what I uh, would like to say that, you know, the, the advancement of society was such that it led to uh, this maritime battle and in the end uh, the uh, sword of the dev devas they won and they gained Im immortality because uh, they are still existing today and the asuras you know that entire civilization was completely uh, destroyed uh, next slide please now i'll uh, simultaneously take four ancient civ civilization moving a step ahead uh, next slide please i'll start with the uh, one of the most uh, ancient civilization uh, that is the Mesopotamian or the uh, Sumerian civilization. Uh, if you look at this map, you know, the green portion is a fertile piece of land, unlike what Mesopotamia or uh, Iraq, Iran, uh, this area is, is, is today. But at that point of time, it was a fertile piece of land. And you see the layout, the geostrategic layout of this piece of land with so many water bodies, Black Sea, Red Sea, Mediterranean, Pers uh, Persian Gulf. Uh, next slide, please. So this society thrived uh, and uh, this, this society prospered. You know, they had a very good agrarian society as in a system of canals. They had good policing and a good, uh, you know, uh, legal system. And some uh, uh, ancient uh, sub-civilizations also prospered, including the Sumerians, Assyrians, Akkadians, Babylonians, may not be simultaneously, but at different points of time. And they were also fighting with each other. But what happened, you know, uh, in the new course of day, they were developed their naval, naval capabilities. They did have a trade uh, trade with the Indus Valley or the Egyptian civilization, but they did not completely develop their uh, maritime capabilities, uh, which uh, was, you know, uh, which was uh, taken care of by the uh, Persians as well as the Greeks, you know, when they uh, when they conquered these areas. Uh, and over a period of time, uh, due to the climate change, uh, this agrarian uh, society, you know, it completely became this area became a desert uh, desert area. Subsequently, the Persians and the Greeks they they fought battles here. Next slide, please. And one of the uh, well known battles, you know, when the Persians had fought a battle of Salamis uh, towards the uh, towards the uh, Greek city of uh, Athens, uh, where the uh, Persians were completely outnumbered and outclassed, uh, and uh, the, the tussle between these civilizations continued and it continues till date. Next slide, please. Coming on to the uh, Egyptian civilization, you know, starting from the uh, mouth of Nile River Delta uh, and coming down south. So the ancient Egyptians, you know, they, they also were an agrarian society. So one point which I want to bring out here is that uh, when we talk about the Egyptians, so there was there was mainland uh, Egyptians and there were the peripheral uh, societies, uh, you know, which were towards the sea coast and they were always at war with each other. So uh, one of the societies uh, uh, in, in, in the Egyptians was uh, sea peoples, you know, which had uh, completely, they, they, they were ruling the complete Mediterranean, the coastal areas, and they were always in fight uh, with the uh, ancient Egyptians, the pharaohs. 
and uh, there is a very epic battle you know between uh, king ramesses 2 as well as 3 between the, with the sea peoples in which king ramesses has outnumbered and outclassed the sea peoples but uh, as as the time progressed this area became desert uh, the climate change took place and uh, this area was uh, ca captured by the greeks and thereafter the romans the romans also ruled this uh, nile river delta uh, only the mouth portion of it uh, the egypt uh, for almost 1000 years till they were defeated uh, by the uh, by the ottomans in the battle of constantinople uh, one important uh, next slide please one important aspect of uh, battle of constantinople was the use of a sea pirate you know it was a it was a non state actor uh, being used, used by the uh, byzantines uh, and uh, you know despite having that kind of uh, a sea pirate you know who had experience uh you know they were out outnumbered and outclassed by the uh, ottomans next slide please i come uh, towards the east now and i uh, would take you to the chinese uh, civilization so here again there was a constant battle between the mainland chinese and the peripheral chinese in fact there is a quote that maritime china was always uh, peripheral so the mainland chinese you know they they had a navy but then their um, uh, navy was uh, restricted toward the uh, inland waterways they were all also at war with the mongols as well as at some point of time with the tibetans and they were constantly at war with the peripheral chinese you know peripheral chinese had a different class of ships the mainland chinese a different class of ships and they were constantly you know fighting with each other uh, they did not learn uh, from the lessons of history until uh, uh, in the medieval era when the british during the two opium wars uh, they they captured they conquested uh, uh, the the china uh and thereafter they took a lesson and probably what we see that the growing uh, presence of uh, the pla navy uh, in in south china sea uh, indian ocean region uh, that they have taken the lesson that you know they you need to exist as a as a civilization and you need to uh, develop a strong very very strong maritime capability coming on to the next next slide please coming on to the indus valley civilization uh, next slide please yeah so coming on to the indus uh, uh, river civilization uh, we have uh, since the morning we have seen uh, how advanced our forefathers were uh, how advanced were our capabilities uh, were especially during the time of raja bhoj raja bhoj uh, ruled from bhopal and uh, then chandragupta maurya ashoka but then as a as a subcontinent we were never together we were also at constant war with uh, with each other if we talk about the chola raja raja chola or rajendra chola they uh, that empire was uh, in the south uh, south of india and uh, it was seldom that you know what the the, the manner in which we see india today uh, yes ma'am I'll, i'll be just finishing it anyway okay thank you thank you yes, uh so we also uh, never existed and we never uh, uh, you know ex existed as a, a singular society and uh, developing our uh, maritime capability despite having advancement in the field of science uh, technology and uh, astronomy and uh, navigation next slide please next slide please so what do we learn from that next slide so uh, despite having a geo strategic uh, advantage uh, uh, you know whatever dominance which we have we could not we cannot fight the climate change and uh, these civilizations you know the, they uh, like uh, indus valley uh, we continue to have our uh, historical and cultural bag uh, baggage that we will not touch the ocean water so we never ventured into the ocean so we always invited the invaders but we never uh, went out even to uh, protect our coastal system uh, till the time of shivaji maharaj shivaji maharaj uh, did have a very strong uh, coastal defense system next uh, next slide please next slide so what do we learn uh, from this is that uh, and what are the recommendations which i have uh, taking the lessons from the mythological era and the uh, ancient era is that we need to firstly create a sense of belongingness with the sea like we have a sense of belongingness with our motherland matrubhumi we also need to have a sense of belongingness in the entire nation that yes this is our maritime uh, borders with this is our maritime heritage we need to promote trade uh, and uh, uh, you know uh, tourism in these areas we need to also carry out you know enhance our force structuring on the lines of ibg that what is going on uh, right now but in, in addition we also need to further enhance the coast guards we might also have like we have uh, 
uh, uh, territorial army we can also have territorial navy consisting of the fishermen from the local uh, local areas we can also have like we have nsg we can have marine ships. so when we diversify the security of our maritime borders maybe we'll be able to come out with a better concept of how we can uh, secure our uh, maritime boundaries that is our area of influence and also then the navy can uh, ensure that you know we uh, we are taking interest properly in our area of interest that is the indian ocean region as well as the south china sea and and then further beyond and while we do all this infrastructure building and all that we also need to also ensure that we need to take care of the climate change that we do not put so much pressure on the ocean that it once again you know results into a catastrophe i finished here uh, thank you very much jai hind thank you thank you kanal agarwal uh, i would like to thank all our presenters uh, it was indeed an insightful session uh, professor sahastrabude rightly highlighted the need to appreciate india's philosophy of anti piracy missions in ancient and medieval times uh, since we have a multi millennial legacy of traversing through the indian ocean region i think it is important as as uh, she mentioned in her uh, uh, remarks to revisit these narratives for defining our present and future course of strategy towards the region mr venkatesh's paper also uh, uh, looked at a very interesting aspect of india's maritime history and he looked at the naval attacks by the indian pratihara empire across iraq persia and the arabian coast and how they reflect a very unique military uh, maritime doctrine and a strategic view of the western maritime theater in the overall security calculus by a major indian subcontinental power um uh, miss francis paper also uh, provided us good glimpses of the trade between india and rome including the trade routes the goods and the commodities uh, there are very rich literary records that provide useful information for many archaeologists and historians to analyze the history of trade and finally we had uh, colonel arun's paper uh, which looked at the comparative analysis of mesopotamia egypt chinese and the indus valley civilizations from a maritime perspective it's always very fascinating to explore world history through the lens of the sea uh, you know how people first came into contact with one another by ocean and how goods languages religions and entire cultures uh, spread across along the world's waterways bringing together civilizations and how do we draw lessons from this existing reservoir of knowledge and then devise our future strategy so very very interesting papers and thank you all for sharing your wonderful work and uh, once again thank you to all the speakers and all our viewers who have joined us for this session i now hand over the floor to saba thank you so much thank you professor mansi the session was indeed very inv invigorating We are now nearing the end of the conclave, and to sum up the session, I would like to introduce patron MHS Vice Admiral A R Karve. Vice Admiral Karve was commissioned into the Indian Navy on 1st July 1980. Vice Admiral and retired after 38 years of distinguished naval service in July 2018 as a flag officer commanding in chief, Southern Naval Command. Admiral Karve has held prestigious positions in the flag ranks as steering Indian Naval Operations Chief of Personnel and Chief of Staff at Western Naval Command. He has been closely associated as a paper presenter, supporter and trustee of the Maritime History Society on many occasions. I now would like to invite Vice Admiral A R Karve to deliver the valedictory address. Vice Admiral R Hari Kumar Flag Officer Commanding in Chief Western Naval Command Professor Rama Shankar Dubey Vice Chancellor Central University of Gujarat Mr Hasmukh Shah Founder and Chairman of Darshak Itihas Nidhi Rear Admiral Atul Anand Vice Chairman of MHS Commodore Robby Thomas Director MHS Distinguished Lead Speakers Moderators participants and all maritime enthusiasts as we come to the close of this annual maritime history conclave 2021 i would like to take this opportunity of congratulating the maritime history society and central university of gujarat center for security studies for seamlessly coordinating and conducting this conclave 
the annual maritime conclave was a bridge of knowledge spanning practitioners, processors, that is academics and research associates and producers' perspectives. Today, it is observed that even in conducting maritime diplomacy, there is a deliberate and conscious effort to emphasize the maritime, cultural, civilizational, and historical linkages of countries. This approach finds resonance across all parties and, in fact, lays the foundation for cooperation between them. Hence, there is a need to comprehend the perspective from history and maritime history in multi-dimensional and multi-sectoral fields. Our nation's maritime activities during the Vedic age have been mentioned in the Rig Veda comprising 1,000 hymns. The chronicles of our country's maritime history are also referenced in ancient Indian literature such as Arthashastra, Mahabharata, Puranas and Ramayana as well as foreign sources such as Indica and the Peripolis of the Eritrean Sea. Our ancestors knew many aspects of seafaring such as the nature of the seas, the winds, skill of shipbuilding, navigation and so on. With such a rich maritime tradition spanning over five millennia, there is a lot more that remains to be discovered about India's maritime heritage. Today's event successfully established a connection between ancient maritime history and its current relevance in defense diplomacy. The themes of the seminar explored multifaceted aspects of India's Indian maritime history from ancient and medieval times and showed how it is reliable in the current geopolitical scenario. Due to the prominent position of India in the Indian Ocean region, it was an important hub for trade in ancient times and even today with the current geopolitics, maritime trade and the increasing power and reach of the Indian Navy, India's role has become even more essential because of the need to maintain international order at sea. As rightly highlighted by Vice Admiral R. Harikumar and Professor Rama Shankar Dubey, civilizational narratives have always been woven into our contemporary maritime vision to emphasize the natural continuum of a rich maritime tradition the country has inherited. Maritime History Society and Central University of Gujarat Center of Security Studies has been continuing on its journey of promoting Indian maritime consciousness through different outreach imperatives. And this annual maritime conclave is one example of that very effort. I believe it is fitting to acknowledge the efforts of Dr. Ashok Rajashirke for his key insights and knowledge on various coastal features, cartographic forms, and the use of navigational aids, which form a crucial part of ancient Indian nautical knowledge. We thank Dr. Dipesh Karmarkar for moderating session one effectively and analyzing the roots of nautical knowledge from a historical paradigm. Professor Uttara Sahasrabuddhe, as a lead speaker of session two, examined the maritime dimension of India's security through various historical narratives in a comprehensive manner. And Dr. Mansi Singh moderated the session asserting the early maritime contribution of various Indian empires on Indian Ocean, on the Indian Ocean, which envisaged maritime governance. Lastly, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of the paper presenters, the young maritime enthusiasts and scholars for their participation and for presenting unique research findings on the various themes of nautical knowledge and maritime security of India of the early and medieval period. This conclave has proved to be another step in charting a course for understanding early and medieval history of maritime India. With multiple stakeholders, academic 
and scholarly discussions and plans to further the cause of maritime studies underway, annual Maritime Conclave 2021 is a significant platform for making the study of maritime history and heritage relevant to the larger audience beyond historians and heritage professionals. In conclusion, therefore, one can say that maritime history constitutes a source of identity and is a way to connect all of us to the oceans and not just to those living along the coast. The historical and heritage anecdotes that we discussed at length today in the annual maritime conclave are evidence of thousands of years of settlement, exploration, immigration, harvesting the bounty of the seas and creating coastal communities and maritime traditions. Acknowledging, researching, protecting and promoting the diverse fields of the, these maritime domain issues would help India lead with confidence. With efforts of academic institutions like Maritime History Society and the Central University of Gujarat, Center of Security Studies, there is indeed a new resurgence in maritime studies in India. And I only hope that we continue to excel in our work and inspire others to work in the maritime domain. With that, I have finished. Thank you. Jai Hind. Sam Novaruna. Thank you, Karvesa, for the encouraging words. It is an honor to introduce Vice Chairman MHS, Flag Officer Maharashtra Area, Rear Admiral Adil Anand. Rear Admiral Adil Anand, VSM, is an alumnus of the National Defense Academy, Khadak Vasla, the Defense Services Command and Staff College, Mirpur, Bangladesh, and the National Defense College, New Delhi. A recipient of the Vishishta Seva Medal, the Admiral has held several key command appointments in his naval career. As a flag officer, he has served as Assistant Chief of Naval Staff, Foreign Cooperation and Intelligence at Integrated Headquarters of Ministry of Defense, Navy, and Deputy Commandant and Chief Instructor at the National Defense Academy, Kharakwasla. With this introduction, I would like to invite Rear Admiral Adil Anand to deliver the valedictory address. Thank you, Ms. Sabha Purkar. Vice Admiral R. Hari Kumar, Flag Officer Commanding in Chief, Western Naval Command, Mr. Hasbuk Shah, Founder and Chairman of Darsak Itihas Nidhi, Professor Ramachankar Dubey, Vice Chancellor, Central University of Gujarat, Vice Admiral A. R. Karve, Patron MHS, Dr. Sanjay Kumar Jha, Professor and Dean of Center for Security Studies, Central University of Gujarat, Commodore Robbie Thomas, Director MHS, Moderators, Distinguished Lead Speakers, Participants and all Maritime Enthusiasts. Ladies and Gentlemen, you would all agree with me that throughout history, the maritime domain has been a crucial space in establishing new and emerging powers who in turn have shaped regional dynamics and the larger maritime security architecture. It is a well-known fact that as a prominent maritime nation, India's overall development as a nation is closely linked to its maritime activities. Today, like every year, the Maritime History Society has very successfully conducted the annual Maritime Conclave, which gave us deep insights into our nautical history. It is therefore an honor and a privilege for me to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of the Maritime History Society and the Central University of Gujarat. We have heard some very powerful and thought-provoking academic nuggets and thus my special and sincere expression of thanks to all the eminent moderators and speakers for the rich and hugely valuable contribution to this flagship endeavor of the MHS and Central University of Gujarat. We are very grateful to Vice Admiral R. Hari Kumar, Flag Officer Commanding-in-Chief, Western Naval Command, who has always encouraged the Maritime History Society for its academic endeavors and provided visionary guidance as well as support for the successful conduct of this conclave. I would also like to thank him for his inaugural address. I take this opportunity to express our special thanks to the founder and chairman of Darsak Itihas Nidhi, Mr. Hasmuk Shah, 
for delivering the guest of honor speech. I also sincerely appreciate their collaboration with the Maritime History Society to raise awareness of our national nautical history through the book Malam Nipothis, the translation of Kachi Navigational Diary of Boatmen. I wish to make a special and laudatory mention of the support rendered by Vice Chancellor Prof. Ramashankar Dube and Dr. Sanjay Jha, Professor and Dean at CUG for Center for Security Studies. I would also like to express my sincere thanks and gratitude to Vice Admiral K. R. Kabe, Patron MHS, for the thought provoking valedictory address. Lastly, my thanks are due to the Director of Maritime History Society and his dedicated as well as effective operations and research team who have worked tirelessly to make this conclave a huge success. Thank you all. We look forward to more such fruitful interactions. Jai Hind and Sharno Varuna. Thank you, sir, for the kind words. Indeed, the conclave has proven to be fruitful with inputs of experts and the research conducted by the paper presenters. Today, we have journeyed through maritime history from various aspects of nautical knowledge to examining the maritime dimensions of Indian security through various historical narratives. This showcases just how vast the maritime domain is and the tremendous scope of research that it encompasses. I applaud the effort of paper presenters and thank them for sharing their insights. I congratulate everyone involved in the conclave for their valuable contributions. MHS in its endeavors will continue to work actively in the maritime domain with specific efforts in research, museum, and spreading awareness of the maritime domain to the public. I hope our audience today enjoyed the session and will continue to support us in our journey. If you missed the event, you can watch it on our YouTube channel where you will find the videos of our previous events as well as informative videos on maritime matters. Do visit our Twitter, Facebook and Instagram handles and, and the MHS website www.mhsindia.org as we keep posting informative anecdotes for our audience. Do share the maritime knowledge imparted today with your friends and colleagues and let the heritage awaken our maritime consciousness. Thank you.